I'm Les Abbott, professor here and chair of the Lytle Lectureship Committee. And I want to say what an honor it is for, to be asked to introduce our speaker today. Um, after a very careful process, we, where we initially considered about 100 possible speakers, we have our top choice, our number one choice of speaker today. And I'll give you a little background, a little background of how we ended up to the point we are at today with our speaker. In 1992, I worked with others, some in this room, within my own research community, which is the IEEE Signal Processing Society. We wanted to ensure that we found, we had a way to ensure that our signal processing work would impact society at large. Now remember, this is 20 years ago, before handhelds, before cell phones, before digital TV. We were in a disparate community in that society with branches in other areas, circuits and systems and control and communications, and we had people with strong personalities working in areas like multi-rate, time frequency, filter banks, and multi-scale analysis. We all seemed to agree on one thing, that a workshop with a keynote speaker from a true technical leader who was across as many areas as possible would be the best way to proceed. Our goal was to find someone like Dennis Gabor. Dennis Gabor was an electrical engineer who won the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now he passed away in 1979, which was before this workshop. So when we asked around, we said we're looking for someone like a Dennis Gabor. And everyone across fields pointed to a physicist and mathematician who was the modern version of Dr. Gabor. That's the closest they could say. And I went, oh my goodness, she's going to cross fields. And that workshop's keynote speaker, who kindly accepted my invitation 20 years ago, has subsequently had an impact on things that we're all doing and saying now, after those 20 years. Modern signals and images across areas of science and engineering. And that keynote speaker has returned 20 years later to be our speaker today. Our 2012 Lytle Lecturer is Professor Ingrid Dovshees. She's the James B. Duke Professor of Mathematics at Duke University. Among her many awards, Professor Dovshees is pre presently the president of the International Mathematical Union. She received a MacArthur Fellowship in 1992 National Academy of Sciences Award in Mathematics in 2000, the Benjamin Franklin Award for Electrical Engineering just last year, and back to our area, my own area, the IEEE Jack S. Kilby Medal, the highest honor you can get from the IEEE Signal Processing Society in 2011. She holds honorary doctorates and is a member of national academies in several countries and was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 1998. Professor Dubshi's talk is titled, Quantifying the Dissimilarity Between Services. Professor Dubshi's. Well, thank you for this, this very kind introduction, which really made me blush. I hope I'll now live up to your sky-high expectations. Um, okay, so uh, this is not really uh, an electrical engineering talk, but on the other hand, electrical engineers have, in my experience, such wide-ranging interests and appetites for mathematics in, uh, that have applications. Plus, it is really about trying to find and define ways of interacting with reality and signals, and, and so I hope you will enjoy this. Um, this is all work that is joined with and uh, uh, stimulated by my uh, interaction with Jaron Lippmann, who was a postdoc with me, and you see here with his then, I mean, he's still the youngest, but I mean, he's now a little older. Uh, uh, he was a postdoc with me at Princeton for three years. He's now gone back to Israel. He has a position at the Weizmann Institute, and uh, he, he really, uh, got me to a completely different field, and uh, uh, which I enjoyed very much. So Yaron is a mathematician, applied mathematician. Uh, he is an expert in computer graphics, and I think he might well by now hold the record for uh, consecutive uh, years of uh, papers getting accepted in SIGGRAPH, which is their 
top conference and so on. Uh, part of that is that he's very smart, but also that he can code with the best of them. And uh, he uh, likes to design new algorithms. I mean, computer graphics is a lot about uh, finding algorithms, ways of dealing with uh, uh, surfaces and, and, and uh, other things in computer graphics. Uh, but he likes to build his algorithms on geometric understanding, and which is what I found very appealing. Uh, he came to me because I had worked on uh, mathematical aspects of uh, things in subdivision algorithms, which are used in computer graphics. And so a professor at uh, his university contacted me and said, look, I mean, there's this young man and he's looking for a postdoc. I think you would enjoy working with him. And boy, was that a good recommendation. I mean, uh, I really, uh, he was looking for another way of using his skills, and I'll come back to that. Uh, um, well, I can tell you right now, computer graphics is driven by, uh, partly, by, uh, in great part, by the money that is uh, in video games and in animation movies. And, uh, I mean, they provide many really interesting questions, but uh, I, Yaron was a little bit wistful about that. I mean, all this, this fancy stuff, and I mean, all because video games are so popular. And uh, uh, I had, when he told me about what he, what he did and about his geometric motivation, I said, but I'm sure there are really interesting questions in science that we can tackle with this. And so he was all fired up about that. And this is the story of uh, that collaboration. Okay, so as, as I said, 3D animation relies on computer graphics and computer graphics use three-dimensional mesh models. So in the beginning, was the teapot. This is actually something that I got from, from uh, internet, the first uh, 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 mesh realization of the teapot. It's actually just the standard Milita teapot. And uh, that, that uh, uh, when, when people in computer graphics were making these mesh surfaces and uh, the spouse of one of them said, why don't you use an everyday object? And so he digitized the Milita teapot. And the teapot now has become much fancier and so on, but it's actually an, an, an in-joke that in uh, uh, computer uh, uh, graphics-based movies, like the Pixar movies, there's a teapot somewhere. The teapot is always in there. I mean, it may be a toy teapot in a dollhouse and so on, but it's there. You spot it next time. Um, Okay, so they became much more sophisticated over the years. I mean, so here you have a couple of examples. Uh, one for uh, an architectural design, one for a computer-aided design of manufa for manufacturing. And, well, one in computer graphics. Woody is, uh, uh, I mean, from Toy Story, from the Toy Story series, uh, uh, was first actually designed with NURBS. I mean, so uh, uh, spline surfaces. Uh, later, Pixar moved to uh, uh, subdivision meshes. The big difference between uh, uh, subdivision meshes and NURBS is that in subdivision meshes, I mean, uh, uh, this on the right is Jerry from the little short Jerry's game. He also became the doctor in toy, uh, the toy doctor in Toy Story 2. I see people not here who have small children. But, uh, so in, 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 in uh, Jerry, his whole hand is just one surface. If you did that with NURBS, then, for instance, every nail would have to be a different NURB and, and so on, and you would have to be very careful about making it possible to animate it easily so that no gaps would open between these different surfaces. But with uh, subdivision, it's very simple. You just have a mesh and you make the rules slightly different in how you refine the mesh, and that will do a fine job for the hand, and it's very easy to animate. And actually, between Toy Story 1 and Toy Story 2, uh, Pixar changed from NURBS to subdivision surfaces. And uh, the first long movie they made with subdivision surfaces was A Bug's Life. And by Toy Story 2, the advantage they had from subdivision was so great that they re-digitized every single character from the uh, Toy Story 1 into, into a subdivision. So now they, all these machines cranking away in the basement of, of Pixar do subdivision. Okay. So um, we've talked about uh, imagining objects and so on, but you can also scan existing objects. And you can do that via uh, 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 light that you send on it and you measure how, how fast it comes back. Or you can uh, project a bar 
uh, bar, bar uh, patterns onto faces and see how they get deformed or objects, how they get deformed and from that, if you film it from different angles, get the 3D information. But in any case, out of all that, if you take an existing object and you try to digitize it, you get a point cloud. And then from that point cloud, you will have to triangulate it. I mean, and I'm not going to go into that. There exist good algorithms for doing that. So you get a triangulation. Um, and then with that uh, representation of the surface, you can do many things. Here's an example uh, that I also gleaned from internet in which you uh, have an object that uh, was scanned. Then you have on the screen the rendering of, that, uh, of, of the data set that you get that, dis uh, that displays the uh, triangulated surface. And then on the right, you have an object that actually was milled from uh, plastic or maybe, yeah, this was milled. Nowadays, we, we, we have 3D printers uh, uh, to, to, to make this object uh, uh, from the digital model. So we can do all these things. Now, once you have a triangulated, surf a triangulated surface, you can also edit it. And this is uh, shown here. I mean, you have a subdivision mesh uh, rendered just below it. You have this, this, this camel head. And then by just changing a few parameters in it, you can open its mouth. You can do all kinds of things with it. So, but you may want to do more with surfaces. If you generate a surface, you edit it but for animation. But when you, rec when you, when you scan surfaces, you would like to be able to recognize that, I mean, you have identical surface. If I scan twice the same object, I'm going to get different point clouds, different meshes. How do I even know it's the same? Or how, if I know they're not the same, but they're uh, versions, similar versions of each other, how do I recognize that? I mean, it's not obvious if you think about it. And how do you quantify the difference? Here I'm showing you two versions of a Volkswagen Beetle one the real thing and one the dinky toy version. Actually, the dinky toy version, that's just a little uh, one of these, these trivia uh, items uh, on, the, on the side. The dinky toy version is not a scaled version of the full Volkswagen. If you make a scaled version, it looks too long. It doesn't look like it's right. They had to kind of make it a little shorter in order for it to look right. I mean, we, we, we seem to have a, an, uh, a stubbier version in our head than, than the real thing. So, uh, well, suppose you had these two, how would you quantify that difference? I mean, if you took two scans of it. So, um, this is actually something that even in animation, uh, people worry about. I mean, how do you have these humanoid characters walk in a natural way? The way it's usually done is that an actor is asked to go through motion with uh, reference points uh, 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 signaled on, 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 on the actor in, co in, 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 in a dark costume. And these, this motion is filmed then, all these points, and then those same points are put on the artificial character and that way you can make the character move. So you have then already also the question of, is this really necessary? I mean, as I said, in animation, there is a lot of, of money. And so they can go, they can hire actors and do all this thing. Um, techniques like this would be very useful for biologists who, interested, who are interested in locomotion of animals. I mean, they film them and so on. They don't have the money to have these expensive sensors put on the and so on. And even when they do, these animals hate having all these things. I mean, I, I work uh, with people in the lemur center at Duke and they, for many tests, they have uh, done a little bit of training of the animals for, so that they make it much easier, for instance, for them to, to, to pack them up in a crate and move them to a different location. They have just done a little bit of conditioning and so that the animal will walk by its on its own into the crate, so it gives much less stress because stress, I mean, is bad for their health, is bad for the experiment, bad for everything. So <laughs> it's even bad for the experimenters who then also get stressed. So uh, the, um, but the one thing where they can do this is for locomotion tests where they need markers because, I mean, uh, lemurs do not like this thing attached to their fur. And uh, so having, doing ways in which you can recognize automatically certain reference points on a movie where you have the same object in different positions would be very helpful for them as well. Okay, so to 
uh, recapitulate, we need to recognize, we would like to be able to recognize when two point clouds correspond to the same or to very similar surfaces. We'd like to quantify, if they're not the same, how different they are. I mean, and that will solve the, the first problem too, because if they're not different, we'll find a distance of zero. So, uh, and we'd like to find ways of, if we have two surfaces that are not the same object, how to find points that are very similar between the two. I mean, so the object, two objects could be a person in different positions. How are you going to find my elbow on each of these? and say this is always the elbow, this is always the top of our middle finger, and so on. So, okay. Um, let's talk about distance. Distance between surfaces. There are many ways of uh, calculating the distance between surfaces that have been proposed. And, um, and, and uh, okay, so our work on, on, on this particular topic in, in biological surfaces started by my have meeting in a, a meeting with uh, scientists of many different stripes, uh, uh, somebody who was interested, a morphologist, a morphometrician, who was interested in um, uh, dentition of mammals. And so he told me that they had recently uh, found a way of measuring the complexity of the chewing surface of molar teeth and uh, that they had related that complexity to diet. And I'm talking about complexity, not uh, uh, scars made on it by eating uh, woody things or so on. I'm talking about the teeth itself, the tooth itself, not marks from the, from, from the food, and uh, things that were independent of scales. So we're talking, uh, comparing mice and elephants um, and finding that uh, both of them eat a lot of vegetation. I mean, rather than insects or meat. Uh, so, uh, and the complexity, they had found a very roundabout way of getting to complexity. What they did is they, they, they scan uh, the surfaces they make, they have these meshes, and then they put them into a, a computer graphics rendition program. And many of these programs have, in order to get, give us an idea of what things look like, they uh, render them as if they were illuminated by three different light sources with different color a red, a blue, and a white one. And so the, the different shadings of the surfaces, depending on whether they exposed most to one or the other light shape, give you an impression of, of I mean, we process that very easily. I mean, even though we don't see the sources, we, 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 our brain thinks about it and sees the, the, the 3D even from a 2D picture. Um, well, I mean, it doesn't see really stereoscopically, but we process the, 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 the the, the spatial dimension, the spatial uh, 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 information. The, so what they had done is they had put it in that, they had then taken those pictures, and they had then looked at how many transitions there were from red to blue from in the facets that they were seeing in their triangulated surface. So they were, in a sense, unwrapping the rendition that had been done by the computer graphics in order to get at the difference in orientation of all those triangles. And when he told me that, I said, well, it's a very clever idea, but I mean, what you're really measuring is something geometric. We should just think about it in a differential geometry way, and we may think of that at variance, and you might even find variants that are more useful. And that's indeed what we did, and uh, we called it, uh, uh, it became, uh, because we used that at, 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 at Dirichlet normals and, 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 and uh, curvature and so on, it was called uh, Dirichlet normal uh, energy and DNE instead of DNA. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, it actually is now a useful tool that these biologists do use in order for complexity. And we found, I mean, what, what the original paper had done when they had extrapolated it from the red and blue stuff, uh, was to do that for a wide range of existing mammals, find that they could very accurately, uh, from this number, extrapolate whether an animal was meat-eating, insect-eating, uh, 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 herbivore, what type of plants, and so on. And then once they had uh, established the ground truth of that with a wide range of existing animals and in different scales, they could then, of course, use that and extrapolate it, use it for all those animals of which they only have teeth and that they didn't, uh, that, that are extinct uh, in the paleontological record. So they were very, uh, this, this paper made nature when it was originally published, and then with this new method, uh, we have a way of computing it in a much more robust way, straight from the mesh, 
instead of going via this, this rendition, and it's, it, it is more accurate. So they were very happy with that. But then and that got us interested in all these problems with meshes. And uh, so uh, uh, they, uh, they explained to us that in order to see how similar two uh, teeth are when they want to compare, what they do is they have to train carefully. I mean, all these little bumps on your molars have names there, an entoconit and a mesasilate and so on, and I have not learned those names. I just learned a few examples so I could boast with them in talks. But uh, uh, they have names, and, 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 and they, uh, they graduate students typically, it takes them two to three years of training to really become very accurate in that, in uh, finding them in all these different uh, vari variations of teeth. And uh, they, they typically take one of these meshes, they mark it by hand on their computer screen, and so they represent one of these surfaces by something like 20 points. And so if you have 20 points for all different teeth, then you have something in R to the 60, and you can look at differences between those vectors and work with those. And that's typically what they did. And as I said, it is something that, in order to do this reliably, takes quite a bit of training. And it also means that the discipline is closed off to people who haven't had that training. And uh, it's, it's, it makes it very uh, uh, non-accessible. Non um, and so the, these biologists were explained to me that they had the feeling that uh, in, in, there's so much progress being made in genomics. And uh, because, I mean, there's lots of mathematical difficulties in extracting genomic information and so on. So they, I don't, they didn't want, nobody wants to belittle that. But once you have the genomics, after all, if you think about it mathematically, what you have is linear strings, 1D, with things that are discrete and that have an alphabet of only four letters. I mean, how hard can it be? I mean, it's hard enough, plenty hard. <laughs> but how hard if you put it like this to make distance between two strings? I mean, conceptually. While here you have surfaces in 3D, I mean, not digital, I mean, and you have to find distances. It's a much harder problem. I mean, not that the genomics is easy, but this is harder. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, um, and it's not as well quantified. And they said, look, people, mathematicians have tried to do things for us, but whenever they bring us a method that they think will work, it doesn't really. I mean, because our expertise, that's why it takes us so long to train on it. We, we take into account not only the shapes of the different pounds, but the relations of the ones between them, the, the landscape of the whole thing. I mean, we don't articulate it. Well, they didn't say it that way, but I mean, my conclusion is they didn't articulate it. They absorb it by osmosis, a bit like radiologists get trained by, by kind of osmosis. And they, produce, they, have, they form an expertise, clearly, but... Uh, there was no distance, no mathematical distance that really gave that. Okay, so I said, well, I recognize a challenge when I see one. We should be able to do that. And actually, so that's the story of this. So, um, as I said, many distances use on these tag points, a little bit like the motion of the, 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 the actor. These tag points are the typical points that characterize a humanoid figure and uh, there is another distance that does not rely on tag points and that relies on beautiful mathematics, which is called the gromov hausdorff distance, which uh, got quite a bit of, 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 of press in the, the last 10 years or so, um, which is based on the principle that you can always embed in, uh, uh, in, 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 in metric spaces and then look at the distance there. And it looks at actually the minimum of all the possible embeddings, isometric embeddings you can have of your two surfaces into some other space and the minimum or infimum of all the possible distances you have there. So uh, it turns out, I mean, of course, you don't look at the infinity of spaces in which you can embed, but even when you simplify it much and so on, it turns out that this is very heavy to compute. It's a beautiful concept, but it's heavy to compute. And so that was not something that you could use for the kind of thing my, my tooth biologists were interested in because, I mean, teeth, as I said, is it's the thing that survives the most. So as soon as you talk, uh, talk uh, teeth, people in a museum of natural history open a drawer and there are hundreds. And, uh, so, and they want to compare all of them. And uh, so you have to have something that works fast. So uh, what I'm going to present to you is a different approach. Uh, uh, based on uniformization, conformal geometry, and explain that a little bit. 
and optimal mass transport. Actually, the most recently, uh, the most recent version we use doesn't use optimal mass transport anymore, but uses uh, another development that we think will be really of interest, not only to the applications, but also to the, the, the theory of, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, in, in geometry. But, uh, okay, so we start by 2D surface in 3D. It inherits a metric from R3. We have distance in R3. So you can, for two points on a surface, and we all learn how to do this in multivariable calculus, if you have a path through the, the, the two points that lies on the surface, we can compute the distance by integrating. And then you can look at all the possible curves on the surface for which this is the smallest, and that smallest is the distance on the surface, the geodetic distance inherited from the metric in R3. So you have a geometry. For that geometry on the surfaces, it turns out that the surface uh, 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 can be mapped conformally without, so that means without any change of angles locally to either the sphere, if it's a closed surface, or if it's a surface with one hole to the disk. And um, we decided to use, to try to make use of this because it then mapped, meant that we had to search things on, on things that happen on a disk, which is already smaller dimensional. I mean, if you want to make fast algorithms, you have to put yourself in situations where the things you have to search are not too large. And uh, you'll, uh, I'll come back to it. We'll actually have to search only in a three-parameter three space, and for some of it in a one-parameter space. Now, in, in practice, we always discretize. And in applied mathematics, it, it used to be very often the philosophy that you have something nice, you understand the continuous theory of it, and then you approximate. And so uh, we are not going to, and this is a, a, a larger message that I, I want to, to, to talk about here a little bit, we're not going to approximate this on triangulation. But what, we want, what we're going to do is extract the essence of what's happening and then use that to make a discrete construction. So this is something that I think is happening a lot in, uh, in the last 10 years and in many different branches in applied math. Instead of trying to use a high order approximation method in order to take the continuous thing and then have a very close discrete approximation, what you try to do is to really understand the mathematics that is making whatever you want to do further down the road work. And then you want to take that, the marrow of the problem as a certain, in a certain sense, and build that discreetly. I mean, not GOA. I mean, via a good order approximation, you'll, you may, but in most cases, you will not actually have that precisely. What you hope is that you're close enough that those beautiful properties still impact what you are computing and you inherit them in a certain sense uh, by, by, by proxy. But we don't want to do that anymore. So the equivalent in, in, in mechanical engineering, for instance, is to use uh, for something that moves to use a symplectic integrator. It has the right symmetries. Instead of approximating the true mechanics, you make a coarser approximation, but then you have an integrator that has the right structure, and it gives you much better results. So here we're going to do the same thing. You, um, if, you, if you have your, 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 uh, your surface, your uh, uh, triangulated surface, and we want to flatten that. Now, you can't really do that with a surface mesh. I mean, it's, it's just like you can't just take an orange peel and make it completely flat without tearing it up. Um, it, and if you try to, to, to preserve all those triangles, all those angles, you, have, you don't have enough degrees of freedom. It just can't be done. But uh, a, very, uh, 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 a very nice uh, technique was uh, proposed by, uh, uh, by, by two uh, German mathematicians, uh, uh, Pinkel and, and uh, Poltaus, where they uh, realized that instead of using the surface mesh, all these triangles that have shared sides, they introduced the mid-edge point triangle mesh. So in every triangle, you take the midpoints of the sides, and that makes a little, what I call here, here, these little green triangles. And you do that in all these triangles, and now you have a different type of mesh. You have this kind of lacy mesh, in which the triangles sh share vertices. And, but they, of course, encode the whole original geometry because every little of these triangles is conformal 
with the original one. It's just a scaled version. And uh, you can then transform this mesh into a mesh in which every little triangle is uh, 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 flattened to the plane and uh, keeps the same angles, so is scaled. And the different triangles are scaled differently. The result is that when you then try to make the bigger triangles out of it, the points, the endpoints may not quite correspond. But at least you have a, a situation in which you took all the information, geometric information, and you've put it in a flat uh, uh, situation. You, um, what you're really doing, and this is beautifully explained in the original paper, is building on the original meshed, uh, 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 triangular mesh, a, the complex structure, namely directions and orthogonal directions, that is what you use to make the, uh, the, conf uh, the, the, the conformal mapping, the, 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 uh, uh, the uniformization in the continuous case. And so you build that discreetly and you use that to make the whole thing discrete. So, okay, so uh, you have this Riemann structure and you can uh, map every of these mid edge triangles to a similar triangle, and so you can do that conformally. Here is one of these uh, teeth that I'm going to show more of, and with the mid edge triangle, and uh, you can really nicely flatten that. Here I, see, I show you a full uh, uh, triangulated mesh and the mid edge triangle on the right. So, okay. Now, we are interested only in the chewing surface. So that's a surface with a, an, a border. And we're going to, so uh, the conformal mapping of that is to the, the, the uniformization is to the disk. So we want to map that to the disk. Now, if you do that just with all these triangles, and uh, I do the scaling thing, I can map it to the disk, I will get some ragged edge. And then you say, well, how do I get that to the disk? Of course, we know that that can be done, but there's a, a very elegant idea here uh, that, that uh, uh, Yaron came up with. Instead of just doing it straight away, what he did is he said, let's take a triangle away somewhere in the center. Okay, so now I am, and let's put that triangle over infinity. So, what that means is I've taken a triangle away in the center, so you have these two, these, these three triangles that have a hanging vertex. So you should imagine the triangle that was linked to them mapping over here and all the other side of the universe and coming back there at the top. So, uh, of course, that means that the ragged edge of my surface is now somewhere in the middle. Well, you can prove, and that is exactly because you are making a complex structure and preserving complex structure, you can use that to prove that that ragged edge, all which are, again, hanging triangles uh, that have one vertex not connected to any others, that all those hanging vertices will end up on a straight line segment. Beautiful, because that means that together with the triangle that we are missing over infinity, <coughs> We have mapped our, uh, our surface conformally to the plane with a slit. Now, from the plane with a slit to a disk is a very standard and well-known conformal map. So all I need to do is then to apply to this thing, in which I know that all the edges are on the slit, to this, this slit to disk thing, and I will end up with a representation of this chewing surface on the tooth to something that lives on the disk. Very nicely, very clean, very... But because we didn't build an approximation, but because we built something that had the right geometric meaning. Okay, so as I said, they, they, they all lie on a line and beautifully, and you can use that to put things on the disk. Fine, so let's do that. And then it turns out, if you, for instance, here this is illustrated with uh, two computer models of the cat, um, that if you put the cat in different positions, and for both of these objects, you map the triangulation. I mean, so, you, you, so what was done is that these are known with a very high number of triangles, these mesh surfaces. And then uh, uh, what Yaron even did in order to mimic the situation in reality is he downsampled them in different ways so that he ended up with triangulations that were already not the same triangulations for both. And then for each of these, he did the uniformization. And then you see that similar points on the uh, cat end up in things that are similar in their uniformization. So uh, it's not the same thing. You see these triangles 
behave differently in the right corner, right upper corner. But there's definitely a, a sense of uh, sameness between these two pictures. And so we had to capture it mathematically. Except that I am, of course, cheating. Because I'm mapping conformally to the disk. But there are many ways of mapping conformally to the disk. Actually, if you have one mapping to conformally to the disk, any Möbius transformation on that will give you another conformal picture on the disk. And so if you do your two things on these two cats, <laughs> there's absolutely no guarantee. And in fact, uh, uh, we, we know from everyday experience that there's every guarantee that you will not end up with the same pictures. I mean, you will have something that's transformed. And so what you need to do then is you have to take one and go through a discretization of that Möbius group in order to make it as much as the other one as possible. But that's the Möbius transformation that preserved the disk, mapped the edge of the disk to itself, is a three-parameter group. It's actually very simple. It's a very nice and smooth group. So it's very easy to search. I mean. OK, so there is one representation that will look very much like it. So now, looking very much like it, uh, I was showing where the points ended up. So they end up in similar places. The information, the geometry information, is encoded not just in where points end up, but also in how much you had to scale the triangles to make it flat. And so you have, apart from the mapping from your surface to the, uh, to the disk, you also have the conformal factor. How, many did, how much did you have to scale all these things? So you have a landscape. So both of your surfaces have given you a landscape. And what you then do is you search one landscape and transform it and see how can I get it closest to the other landscape. And that's the idea we use for our distance. I mean, so if I have a landscape, then, and this is something that's very familiar to uh, electrical engineers, uh, this is called mass transport, optimal mass transport by mathematicians in the Kantorovich picture, but what it really is is the earth mover distance. You try to see, if you have your two landscapes and you imagine them as sand heaps, what is the cheapest way of shipping the sand from one landscape so that it conforms to the other landscape. So what you do is you have some distance between points. And in the Kantorovich thing, what you do is you try to find a, uh, a measure that lives on the product space of the two. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to do an experiment here. We're going to see whether this works. So, uh, uh, actually, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. OK, so you have, um, you have uh, your two axes here. And uh, so I have x here and y there. And uh, if, if there was a transform that really would map uh, uh, that if one was just a transform of the other, then that would mean that you could define a measure on the product space which just embodied that transform, that was just supported entirely on couples of points where this point was a transform of that point. So you would find some measure so that uh, uh, after you undid the transform, you would be lying on just uh, the, the axis, the diagonal axis. Now, in practice, that's not the case. But what you try to do is you try to find over all possible measures pi uh, on x times y, you try to find the one where you minimize the distance between with respect to pi. I mean, so if you could do it on a diagonal, that integral would be 0. You try to find things that are close to the diagonal. So you take the minimum over all possible pi. And OK, so that is, oh, cancel. Um, so that is the, what we are trying to do here. So we take an integral over all the distances. We integrate with respect to measures on the product space. And the further that measure is concentrated away from the diagonal, the more we will have to pay because the bigger the distances will be. And we take the infimum of all that. And that gives us 
the uh, uh, distance between the two uh, uh, concentrations, mu and nu. Okay, so if they are the same, then you find that pi is that and the distance is zero. So you need a distance. We need to do that whole construction conformally invariant because we know that a Möbius transform may change things. We want it to be robust. That's to say, if we make small mistakes on reading the surface, we want it to, uh, 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 to not cause big, big, big changes. And we want it to be uh, a fast uh, algorithm. So what we did is, um, in order to build in the uh, conformal invariance, we said, well, imagine that we do a Cantorovich kind of thing. So we took that infimum over all the things in the measure. But we look at all the transformed ways. I mean, we took in the Möbius transforms. And we then take the infimum over all those, which is typically what you do. I mean, it's kind of, of quotienting out of that group. Then, using the, uh, uh, what you can do is you can pull in that uh, 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 infimum inside the uh, construction. And uh, um, so uh, you, you, you find that uh, you, you have a, uh, actually I did, I did what, this infimum, the infimum that I'm saying here, this should not be an equal sign. Uh, this should not be an equal sign here. The, uh, uh, the infimum I have here uh, was not preserved here. What I'm saying is that this infimum is the same as an, 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 an infimum I get here by pulling the M through. And uh, uh, so all I'm, sorry, I'm a bit muddled here. But what I'm saying is that I can, this canonical way of doing, I can recast into something in which I make my, uh, 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 I have a, a, something that looks exactly like a Kantorovich formulation, but in which the distance rel uh, relies on the mu and nu. So here, the infimum, I, ho I expect it to be realized in some particular m, in some m twiddle. Then for that m twiddle, this thing would be this particular thing, the m twiddle depending on mu and nu, and then I can pull that in. So this will be the same form after I inf inf I've taken an infimum here as an a Kantorovich problem in which I integrate over a distance that depends on mu and nu. And that made, made us realize that we can allow a dependence on the distance of mu and nu, and that makes it possible to make it uh, uh, conformally invariant. So we actually took a distance, we now write it as a distance for d and mu and nu, which will depend on the two landscapes and we make it robust. And uh, I'm going to, uh, the formulas are given here, but so what, what, let me describe with my hands what we do. To take the distance between two points, what we say is let's look at a little neighborhood, a conformally invariant neighborhood of the two points. Let's look at the Möbius transforms that map this point to that point. There's one degree of freedom left. I mean, because uh, that only uses two degrees of freedom and you still have rotation left. So let's look at all the possible ways of uh, moving this landscape around here. And let's look at how close we can make those two. That is a distance between, not really between the two points, but a distance of similarity of their local landscapes. So we define a landscape similarity between every pair of points. One point in one landscape, one in the other. And the local landscapes, we try to define their similarity. Okay, so that gives us a distance and you can easily see that it's going to be conformally invariant because we look at conformal mappings in doing it. Then. You can, uh, uh, you can compute it simply because that distance was just a one parameter minimization. And then we can use that in a Kantorovich formulation, which relies on solving a linear program, which is fine again. And uh, uh, so we can defi define our distances between the surfaces. So after we've done all that, we now have a candidate. What we liked in it was that it, 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 uh, uh, it uses the geometry. And it had this idea of local distances and knitting things together. 
So it was comparing points based on how their local landscape looked like, but it also, because it used optimal mass transport, had to knit it all together. And so we were hoping that would capture the information that the biologists were uh, intuitively learning in their training. So we uh, applied it to our lemur teeth. I mean, so we, I mean, this paper is, it's, uh, you can find it on the archive. It's, it was published in PNAS uh, in November. So uh, um, at the university, I'm sure you can get it and it should be open access in a couple more months for everybody. So um, we applied, uh, we did it for, for many different things. And let me here switch to the paper itself. Um, oh, cancel. Um, Okay, so in order to validate the, uh, the result, we had to show that indeed we uh, uh, were biologically doing something biologically relevant and that we were finding distances that were as good as what the uh, 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 what the biologists were finding. So let me first show you the result with the method that I just explained. So what's, what I'm showing here is the following. Um, we had hundreds of teeth. We asked uh, the, uh, uh, the trained uh, uh, observer, trained morphologist, to compute her landmarks and to look at distances. So we got an enormous matrix of distances between all those teeth. And it took her days of, of, of drudgery in order to do this because not all of these distances were things that people might be interested in for biological reasons. So, uh, but still, we also computed those distances with our method. And this, uh, the top uh, uh, square here is a way of, 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 did, of, of, of visualizing that. So uh, uh, dark blue means uh, very close and uh, red means very far. I mean, uh, the, we originally did it with the rainbow coloring, but uh, it's, it's been shown uh, that, that this type of, of coloring actually gives more information to people viewing it. So we stick to this now. So we believe our information was the most useful where distances were small. I mean, uh, and that's in fact where you are the more in most interested in it. Uh, so we have blown up two, place, two places where there's a lot of fine structure so that you can see that, I mean, seeing that our methods are very similar to those found by the, the observer, it, you see by symmetry with respect to diagonals. It's below the axis, it's all the observer. Above the axis, it's all us. And so you see, we, we, we do capture that fine structure. I. Um, I said that we have gone over to a different method uh, that I'm not going to explain in detail because I won't have time, uh, which is a, uh, a continuous version of doing procrustes methods that actually is going to link with quasi-conformal mappings, which we are very excited about and we are, we're still uh, uh, generalizing to other situations. And you see that with this distance, we have even a better mimicking of the local. I mean, you see how the, the, the structure is very close to diagonal in the blue part of this diagram. Okay, so we had to validate, we used to, to we wanted to validate this with a, a, a number of, of measurements like this one. And then after we validated, we said, well, what can you use with what we do? And so um, we, and that's the other thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, so here, I'm, um, we, did, uh, we had a data set in which we took, uh, uh, well, we were given by our biologist friends, um, three different types of data sets. On the left, we are looking at molars. In the middle, the middle column, we look at the metatarsal. And in the right column, we look at a radius bone. I mean, we wanted to do it for different bones because, well, in the reviewing process, our, we did it with teeth first and the reviewer said, well, we want to see other bones. So, oops, other bones. Um, we looked actually at many more things than these, but uh, uh, these were what the reviewer liked best uh, to, to show, I mean, because he wanted us to show extreme things. So these are not the examples chosen so that they're the best. These are the th examples chosen by the reviewer as being representative of what we could do. Um, 
So in each case, we start by taking the surface. We have on that surface observer placed landmarks. Then because we have in our, our, our distance, we actually have a mapping from one surface to the other, and that's the strength of our second method. Our first method didn't give actually a global mapping. Our second method does. We have a global mapping, so we can compute our global mapping, and we can map where the landmarks end up after the global mapping. And we can compare that then with where those landmarks had been placed on the other tooth by the observer, by the trained observer. And it turns out we are very, very close. I mean, and as I said, these are not examples chosen for giving the best results. So again, this is a validation. But then what can you use this for? So here is an example of something that, uh, uh, I mean, immediately in, in biology, methods are all very nice, but if you can't use them to get to some new knowledge, nobody cares, rightly so. Uh, so here is a, a comparison between a microcebus and a lepi lemur. So these are two uh, animals, two, two mouse lemurs. So these are two animals this big. So you can imagine how big their molars are. Um, but, uh, and it wasn't clear how the correspondence would do. If you correspond, if you take the two living animals, then it's clear that this yellow point at the top I mean, that's the, a, a natural correspondence. But uh, experts said we don't really know, we don't agree, and so on. Some people said yes, some people said no. And so we decided other people feel that it didn't really correspond, but it corresponded more to the point that uh, I'm circling here with my cursor, this point. And so what uh, the biologists on our team proposed, one of the biologists on our team proposed was, let's look at, instead of doing the, uh, the, the mapping immediately from this living animal to that living animal, let's do two other things. Let's look, compare it with a common ancestor, which is this path in two steps. Let's look at what the yellow point corresponds to when we go to a common ancestor and that, what that corresponds to when we go back to the, the other living animal. Or let's go via a path that has closer relatives to each. So that's the second path that's here at the bottom, the path that has two intermediate steps. And uh, every time following what this point does. And those two uh, uh, genetically more valid, valid uh, uh, paths both map this uh, uh, yellow uh, uh, point to what they would call a metastylid and not an entoconid. So uh, this is the kind of thing that they're very excited about, that, that this will give them a quantitative method to, uh, to, to, to validate arguments that they're using uh, for. In the meantime, we have plenty of other things we are excited about. Uh, looking at all these different teeth. I mean, once you have distances between nearby things, you can start building the manifold. You can do manifold learning of those teeth. You can test models that they have for teeth building, linking them with genetic factors. I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, and so, uh, and this all came because I had a postdoc who was very smart, very bright, and who was eager to see his stuff used in something else than animated movies. And so, uh, and, and we're all, I mean, the biologists are excited, we are excited, and so, thank you. We have time for one quick question. Anyone have a question? Yes. So you mentioned that you had, that in order to get things uh, to conformally map, there had to be a triangle removed, and obviously there are decisions about that, and how does, this depend on the choice of triangle removal or is there a principle So the way question was in order to get to the conformal mapping we removed one triangle and that well how do you decide which one to remove and the decisions about that and the beauty is that it doesn't depend on the triangle because whatever triangle remo you remove you map to this slit plane and that we map to the disk. If you removed another triangle You've got another slit plane and you map to the disk. The mapping from one of these disk things to the other one is a Möbius on the disk. So it's still in our group, the group over which we, 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 we mod out. One more question, quick. At the back. So, um, wow, yes, these 20 points that um, 
that the biological experts have identified as being the ones that they track across different teeth. I imagine that you could do some sort of sensitivity analysis or, or information analysis to figure out where in your manifolds the, the greatest effect is uh, in terms of determining the distances. Have you sort of tried to reverse engineer uh, what the biologists have done to see if they've actually optimized for the right, the right 20 points? No, we haven't, and that's a great question. Thank you, Blaze. I mean, uh, that's uh, uh, and we should we should definitely talk more about this. Uh, what we what when we do the continuous progresses, we do not uh, try to find their twenty points. We actually uh, we we put a Voronoi network down uh, of, and we have about two hundred points. And uh, uh, so so. Uh, uh, but, but trying to analyze them in terms of information, theoretic uh, uh, information, is, is really a, a great idea. We should do that. Yeah, thanks. Well, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>